So you're going to need something to write on, something to write with as we uh, open the word together today. The best way to engage the message is with the Bible, something to write on, something to write with, so that you are really engaging and taking some things home and letting it become part of your, your weekday stuff. Um, we are walking through the book of Isaiah looking for threads of worship. Um, and so that's what we'll be doing on Sunday mornings. Please remember that we're, uh, we've also made a reading plan so that you can read through the whole book of Isaiah. We won't hit every single word or every single chapter this summer, but you can, uh, you can get the whole book of Isaiah through a reading plan. Find it online. Uh, go to our, our Facebook page and scroll down until you find something that says reading plan, and that will uh, show you what you need to, uh, to do. You've got plenty of room to catch up in these early weeks we uh we're taking it slow so you can get in quickly um so who else here is a peach season fan my yeah like peach season for me is a thing um i i i really feel like peach season should have been included in the festivals that he had in the old testament there was the season of peach uh when we all remembered the goodness of the of god and 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 I don't know, I'm trying to make stuff up right now. I just love peaches a lot. And, you know, I think as I have gotten older, um, peach season is, well, really, I'd say in the last five years, I've just really, like, I take that pilgrimage across the river to the South Carolina side, because I don't care what anybody says, South Carolina peaches are better. And um, um, I just, I, 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 I wait, I've texted Linda Cutcliffe, because she's my peach-eating friend, and uh, I've texted her twice already just this season to say, is it peach season yet? And she's like, not yet, not yet. But Jackie Barber tells me it actually, or Jackie Rayeth tells me it actually is peach season. So I will be on the other side of the river very quickly. In Mark Buchanan's book, I'm going to come to this in a minute. You'll get it. Um, called, I just wasn't just handing that to you for no reason. <laughs> In Mark Buchanan's book called Things Unseen, he asked this question. What if all our wanting is for something earth doesn't have? So what if my peach season and your addiction and our debt and our serial relationships and all our chronic dissatisfactions with life is it actually is, is actually a yearning for God? I mean, the ancients would tell us that's the case, that we are made to enjoy God. We want to encounter God, even if we don't call it that. That's our hunger. So when Isaiah had an encounter, <laughs> his vision changed his life, prophesied the Messiah, instructed his country. It was a powerful encounter. And that's where we are today. We get to see the encounter that really, though it sits early in the book of Isaiah, it is the centerpiece of Isaiah's whole prophetic vision. Um, he, he, it, it is in this scene that Isaiah encounters God in this overwhelming and clarifying way, and his vision teaches us all kinds of things about what worship does. So look with me at Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to start with verse 1. And I'm just going to walk you through uh, this scene in Isaiah, this vision in Isaiah, very similar to what Sh Cindy shared with us at the beginning of worship. And, um, and we're going to use it to talk about what worship is. So you're going to need to make some notes. Isaiah 6.1 says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. That's the vision he opens the whole book with. Do you remember back in chapter 1? He opens with two words, the vision. In this vision, he's transported into the heavens, raptured, given a glimpse of divine things, and he will spend 66 chapters trying to recover or interpret, describe this indescribable vision. It happened the year King Uzziah died, which was 750 years before Jesus walked the earth. 
And, that, and, those, and all of those years, Israel had so many bad kings. I mean, that's kind of the litany of the Old Testament is, is this king was bad and he was buried with his ancestors. The next king, bad, worse than the others. Lots of idol worship going on. So many bad kings over the generations. But King Uzziah was beloved. He presided over Israel during probably what was the longest season of prosperity in Israel's history, 52 years. So for him to die was a big deal. And when he died, everyone wondered, what would happen to Israel? Who would rule God's people? Would the next king love God like this one did? Even Uzziah couldn't permanently transform Israel's world. So Isaiah, this deeply faithful man, grieved when Uzziah died, both for himself and for Israel. And that's where his spirit was when he went to the temple one day to sit in the presence of God. Look again at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were two seraphim, each ones with each with with six wings, and with two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another. Hear that. They were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Worship invites the glory of God. Isaiah came face to face with God's great holiness. He goes into the temple with his heavy heart, and God's answer is not to answer his questions, but to reveal his holiness, his pure holiness. Isaiah finds himself in the presence of pure holiness. Holiness, pure love, this incredible power, and it overwhelms him. He uses a term in chapter 4 of Isaiah that helps us envision what this moment in chapter 6 is life like. In Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5, he says this, Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by, uh, by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Does that sound familiar? It should, those of you who love uh, uh, Exodus. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. That's the thing. I want you to write that. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge, a, a hiding place from the storm and the rain. The glory will be a canopy. There's a phrase and a feeling I want us to get used to. It is the sense of God's glory covering us. I want to be under a canopy of glory. Mm. So there's two ways to think about this canopy. W one way is to think about how um, Israelites would have gotten married, that Jewish people get married under a canopy. So to be under a canopy, in that sense of it, is to be in this intimate moment of deep communion and commitment with another being. That's one way to think of a canopy. The other way to think of the canopy is the way the ancients thought of the, the sky. They thought of it as sort of a, an umbrella or, I think, planetarium. You know, like this dome that was over us. And, and, and it spread out over us so that we're covered by it. A whole body, sensory experience. And, and that, that is what raptured worship ought to provide us. It is meant to be this whole body experience, a kind of spontaneous combustion, the encounter with God and the praise of God igniting something inside under this canopy of glory like pitching a tent of glory. The Greek word for glory is doxa. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, so let's just remember it together. It can mean splendor or brightness, but also it can, have, it can mean that the trait of defining something as it actually is. Greeks saw the glory of God as explaining 
who he really is. And this is Isaiah in this scene, seeing God as he really is. And it calls out praise. And the Holy Spirit participates in that moment to move him under the canopy of glory. And friends, we have to see this as possible for us. Listen, the Holy Spirit wants to help us participate in the worship of heaven to move under the canopy of glory. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit wants to help us participate in the worship of heaven. So how are you Helping Him help you. How are you helping the Holy Spirit to help you participate in the process? I want you to look again at those seraphim that he describes in verse 2. When Isaiah saw them in the presence of God, these are the kind of angelic being that seraphim are. The name means something like fiery. Notice that there's hardly anything Isaiah can say about God. It is more than he can describe. He can't get past the hem of his robe. So he talks about these angels. He wants to show us at least the effect of the glory of God by describing the ones who are in it. Someone has said of those, the, the, all those seraph, seraphim, they are all wings and voice. Isn't that great? All wings and voice. All praise and movement. To be in God's presence is to be filled with praise, with worship. John Oswalt talks about them calling out to one another. Remember I said notice that. They call out to one another and he says, listen to this. This is them delighting with one another in the glory of God. I cannot express corporate worship more accurately than that. And I got to tell you, I have struggled to express corporate worship in this week. I was like, I, I, I told Chris last night, I got nothing. I got nothing. There's no way to express it. There's no way. But as close as I can come, listen, that's what corporate worship does for us. It helps us to delight with one another, with one another in the glory of God. Which is to say that praise in heaven, it happens in community, that there is a mutual feeding in this work, and it is physical. It's not just emotional or, spir- or, 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 uh, or spiritual. It is also physical, a whole body experience. When we do things like standing for the songs or raising our hands in worship, it's how we participate. It is how we put our whole selves in. And that can feel vulnerable. I get it. I didn't grow up in a church that did this. I grew up in a church where one man in the back got filled with the Holy Spirit, and he did this, and everybody else thought he was crazy. I didn't even come here doing this. You're the ones who taught me how or gave me a place safe enough to really experiment in myself and find how to worship with my whole being. I know some of you come in here and we're a mostly introverted crowd, we are, aren't we? But I have to tell you, introversion doesn't excuse you from the worship of the living God. <laughs> if you've got an issue with that, take it up with Jesus. That's not me. I have, I have, we had somebody come years ago, came in the mosaic out of a Southern Baptist tradition. And after quite a a while, she came to me after church one day and she said, I lifted a hand. I lifted a hand today. She said, I just lifted one so that in case anybody asked me about it, I could say I was asking a question. (laughs) 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 You know, I've, I've kind of found my own things. I... You'll, you'll see me sometimes doing this. This is actually me grabbing his beard. Yeah. Looking into his face. I had an elder, a spiritual elder, tell me once, he said, what is the difference between this and worship and a two-year-old asking to be picked up?
So we need a safe place. Because it's, worship is meant to, to take over your whole being. What I've learned is that the act of physically responding somehow opens spiritual pores. And I can't really tell you why that is. I just know that it is. And even when I so poorly encourage the work of worship in this room, I ask you to you know, find that posture that is passionate, not passive. This is why, because somehow when we enter in, Honestly, maturely, vulnerably enter in. Our worship invites the glory of God and it brings us into the worship of heaven and we help each other delight in God as we change the very atmosphere of the room. So understand, understand that your investment in this room matters to the people around you. You've all been in rooms where nobody was invested physically. You know this, right? People around you depend on you. One of the purest souls in this church is Matthew Henning, who I count as a spiritual leader among us, and he is defenseless against the Holy Spirit. And you'll watch him when he's up here. I miss him today. You'll watch him when he's up here. He's watching me, and he's watching Mike. And I don't know if you've ever noticed before, but if he's standing next to you up front and he doesn't like what you're doing, you'll find somebody else to stand next to. <laughs> because he doesn't, he doesn't yet have that reticence about him, that southern politeness about him that says, you know what, I am responsible for carrying my weight in worship. How do you enter in? How do you participate in what God is working in? As God invades, as he invites. Go back to verse 3. There's a lot in this verse. They were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. I'm learning that, the, that worship incubates the character of God. 26 times in Isaiah, the Lord is called the Holy One of Israel. Holiness is God's primary character trait. And here he is honored with three holies. That's ultra holy. God is the holiest of holies. If you put a finger in Isaiah 6 and flip back to Psalm 22, this is the psalm Jesus quoted when he, uh, when he was on the cross. It begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, 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 the writer voices his own sense of pain and distance from God, but then he says, I, I really like the way it's worded in the New Living Translation, and he, he says, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. The King James Version says, He inhabits the praises of his people. The Aramaic Bible puts it this way, You are holy, and Israel sits in your glory. I love that. I see this image of plopping down into a pile of dust and having it swirl up all around me. Think of yourself as a child falling down into a pile of leaves in the fall. Do you remember? The leaves would float up and all the pollen would float up. You're a kid. You don't know. You're allergic. You just want it all over you. You're holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. Sitting, uh, Israel sits in your glory. God inhabits the praises of his people. He is enthroned on our praises, which means that when we sit down in his glory, when we begin to praise and begin to thank God for all he has done and praise him for who he is, God will dust up. And in that dusting, we get dusty. If you've not yet had an authentic Isaiah experience, you need some kind of Isaiah experience, my friend. 
Not the kind where you make a better excuse for what you're already doing, but the kind where you fall down in front of God and say, holy, holy, holy. I believe there are some things, listen, I need to say this to you. I believe there are some things that will not turn around in your life. Some purposes that will not be revealed until you allow yourself to be exposed to the glory of God, until you get dusty. There's another thing in verse 3. It it teaches me that worship ignites uh, spiritual warfare. Worship ignites spiritual warfare. The name for God used, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. Most In the NIV, most of the time, that's exactly how it's translated. Lord God Almighty or Lord Almighty or the Lord of hosts. You'll, you'll see it that way sometimes. But, the, but the, the, the word, is the Hebrew name is actually Jehovah, Jehovah Sabaoth. Jehovah means the one who is or the one who exists. This is God, the most true being in the universe, ultra holy. And 270 times in the Old Testament, that name, Jehovah, is paired with Sabaoth. And Sabaoth means uh, armies or hosts, like a host of people, a lot of beings, like an army of them. Jehovah Sabaoth comes from a Hebrew word that means to wage war. So in the New Living Translation, over and over and over, when you read it in that translation, you'll hear it, the Lord of Heaven's armies. That's a whole different way of hearing it, isn't it? The Lord of Heaven's armies. Jehovah Sabaoth is God and all His angels, all creation, all who fight for Him. And Jehovah Sabaoth is the God who brings all all the powers under his control to fight for us. uh, Worship makes us ready for warfare. Steve Seaman says this about King David. He says that before he became a warrior, he learned to play the harp. This is always the order in spiritual warfare, Seaman says. First, we ascend into worship, and then we descend into warfare. telling you if you're if you're in a battle right now the most potent thing you can do is get into a posture of worship worship invites the glory of god it incubates the character of god it ignites spiritual warfare and it inspires confession that's why we started where we started in worship today look at verse 3 He says this, uh, they were calling to one another, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. And, And Isaiah's response is this, woe is me. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, and with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is is atoned for. So what's happening here? What has changed to make Isaiah see himself as unclean? Here's what I think is happening in this moment. I think this is a breaking moment for Isaiah, but not the kind of break that crushes a man's spirit. It's the kind of break that exposes it. Isaiah had been interpreting his life up to this point horizontally. And now, in this moment, in the presence of God, his life is reinterpreted vertically in the light of God's holiness. I want you to remember this, that some things only make sense when the path from A to B comes off the page and touches the character of God. 
This raptured moment places Isaiah in the presence of God and exposes the glory of God. So, we've said the Greek word for glory is doxa. The Hebrew word for glory is kabod, K-A-B-O-D. It means weight or heaviness. That's the kind of glory, that's the weight of glory that Isaiah experienced. When Isaiah stood in God's unhindered presence, he was overcome by his own depravity. I'm a mess. That's the weight of glory. It exposes our most ambitious pursuits as, as empty, as shallow, as lacking, not to condemn us, but to better position us for a life of substance. So listen, God's glory is both kabod and doxa. I want you to write this down. God's glory is the one thing of real substance that has the power to call out the truth of who we are as we stand in the truth of who God is. Frankly, I don't need one more human being to, in my life to tell me how I am getting it wrong. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Is it y'all too? I don't need one more person telling me how I'm getting it wrong. But I'll take the exposure of glory all day, every day. God's glory is the one thing of real substance that has the power to call out the truth of who we are as we stand in the truth of who God is. And you and I have seen this glory. We've seen it. John 1 tells us we have seen this same glory in his one and only son who finds people standing out in the desert of their weakness, unknown, stuck, powerless. And over these souls, over us, he pitches his tent, his canopy of glory and brings his spirit to rest glory this moment in verse 5 is hugely instructive this confession this is this is also worship i need you to notice that the comparison isaiah finds himself making this comparison is not to his neighbor who's killing it or to his person he thinks he ought to be. The, the comparison is to the holiness of God. This is how we keep confession from crushing us. It's by directing it toward the one whose deep desire is to make us whole. In this kind of glory exposure, in this kind of presence, there should be a sense of, oh, oh, I see. What an incredible encounter that was for Isaiah. At no point is he cornered or pushed around. All that is described here is Isaiah's experience and response to what he encounters. And God is doing just what God does. And as God does, Isaiah becomes... You wonder what the coal is made of? The one that touched his lips? I have, a, I have a wish about it. It's not biblical, so don't write this down. But what if that coal was made of the same material as the cross? What if Isaiah was the first human being ever to be touched by the cross? I have nothing to support that theory, but what if? What I can say is that in this moment, right here, Isaiah gives us a lot of clarity about what the cross is actually for. It is so much more than a dumping ground for shame. When that coal touch, touched Isaiah's lips, he received not just cleansing, but a holy hunger to sit in the glory. Isaiah was clothed in purpose in that moment. When I touch the the character of God, I see myself as I am. And when I receive that revelation and let God change me, it sets me up for a life of profound purpose. This is the gift of exposure to what is possible. Let me say that again. Confession is a gift of exposure to what is possible. 
All right, look at verse 8. Worship invokes the call of God. Verse 8 says, when I heard, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. In this prayer, we see how God has cleared the deck for Isaiah. He's not praying for God to protect Israel from another bad king. He isn't asking for answers. Listen, when you've been exposed to the majesty of God, to the wonder of him, when you've encountered the purifying grace of the cross, what's left after everything else is burned away is the purest trust and the holiest surrender. Isaiah has been holified. And then 9 and 10. He said, go and tell this people. God said, go and tell this people. I want you to underline that. Go and tell this people. Be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of these people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. This is not a condemnation. This is a a, a fact is what he's saying. A line that got me this week is that line, go and say to these people, go and tell these people. In the margin of my Bible, I've written, what do you want us to say? I actually underlined the word us. What do you want us to say? And then I just sat with that for a while. What is ours to say? Our vision team put together a two-year task team earlier this year. We're, we're th- that team is working now. Their charge is to look out beyond the pandemic and ask where God is leading us next in, this, in, in the next two years. This was an exercise I asked for because I sort of feel the need to get up above the cloud line, above pandemic uh, re- responses and pandemic anxieties and pandemic fears, above the personal responses of people I love dearly. The combined effects, you know, of all the crises of the last year uh, have, have, has reconfigured our community. In some ways, it has been really hard, but in other ways, we're stronger. We have more than survived this pandemic, but right now, we have this chance to reboot, right? So in the next two or three years, our question has been, what will be our unique contribution to the body of Christ? What does God want us to say? Go to these people and say to them, what, what, what? What is it God wants us, the Mosaic community, specifically to say? What is our message, our call? In that group, we are seeking an Isaiah experience, an Isaiah encounter. We want to sit down in the dust of glory and get face-to-face with God and with his prophetic call on our community so that we can not only get dusty but kind of spread the dust through our community. It challenges me. You know, this, 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 this in Isaiah, the response, you know, when, when God says there are going to be people who just won't get it, there are going to be people, people who, who, who hear but never understand, who see but never perceive. And my, my question is, okay, God, am I going to be a here am I send me guy or am I going to be a seeing but never perceiving guy? What's ours to say? What will expose the glory? Hmm. That's the work of vision. It it bridges the gap between ordinary and glory. What if if God is calling us to get deeply passionate about seeking his glory, doing his work, his vision? We have this chance. Chapter 6 ends with a seed of hope, literally a seed. It's kind of cool what he does. He's like, those last few verses between where we've stopped and the end of the chapter, he just says, it's it's all going to, be obliterated. I mean, there'll be a tenth left, and then we will obliterate the tenth. There'll be nothing left. And then at the very end, he says, and then there will be this stump, this root, this one branch, this seed left. That's what we're after. So in that task team, we've asked some questions, deeply personal questions, I think are meant to get us down to that holy seed. We don't have time right now to go through all those questions but how do you get from woe is me to here am I that's that's the question I want to leave you with how do you get from woe is me to here am I 
How do you not just hear, but hear and obey? How do you get beyond kind of the self-focus, the place where you're really understanding what God has for you? And, and, the, and, and the one question I just want to leave you with, and actually I want to ask you to stand where you are. I'm going to, I just want to give you this question. If, if my heart is raptured by God, what will my communion with him look like? I want to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes. Maybe some of you do want to come here and kneel. If my heart is raptured by God, what will my communion look like? I want to give you the moment, a moment right now to open yourself up, to expose yourself to the glories of God. To, to sit down in his glory and get dusty. If my heart were to get raptured, if I actually let myself just get filled with the Holy Spirit, if I actually let myself experience the deep, deep love of God, in my life, just as my life is, what would that look like? What would that look like? Mm. Lord Jesus, my prayer for my people is that we would encounter your glory, God. I, I just feel such an opportunity in these days. I feel such an opportunity in front of us to, to, to really go, uh, to, to let everything die that needs to die. <laughs> let everything die that needs to die. To let your very angels Sear our souls and our lips, our spirits. Cleanse us so we can emerge from that place full of vision and purpose. Hunger, here am I, Lord, send me. Send me. Send me. What if all this wanting is really for something earth doesn't have? What if there is no thing that we wrestle over, that will feed it. All this wanting is for something earth doesn't have. All this wanting. Jesus. Jesus. I let myself get raptured. What's that going to look like in my life? How will I walk back in to corporate worship if I let myself get raptured? How will I walk in? If I let myself get raptured, how will that affect my quiet times, my personal time with God? If I let myself get raptured, how will that, how will that affect the, the, the groups that I'm part of, my family? If I let myself get raptured, how will that affect my work life? If I let myself get raptured. How will that change my character, change me at the deepest levels? 